Tiki Hut Media. Hey there, welcome into Soul Ramblings Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Wicker. This is where we talk about faith and life, and we're not scared to talk about faith. Today, we wrap up our seven-part series on learning the Jesus way of life by discussing what matters most, what is top priority, what should our priorities be in learning the Jesus way of life. Let's head over to the sanctuary, and we'll get right into it. Our scripture reading for the morning is from... The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, we begin our reading this morning with verse 34. Let us hear these holy words. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good and gracious God, in the silence of this moment, Prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. Welcome to the final week, week number seven of our series, Learning the Jesus Way of Life. And as we close out this series today, we're going to look at one question, one scripture, one application, all centered around helping us answer the question, What matters most? What is really important? Now, we're going to look at Jesus' answer to this question here in just a minute. But first, before we get to Jesus, let's start by answering this question for ourselves. Because all of us have something that we would consider most important. Something that matters most to us. And if, and if you're not really sure what that thing is, a good place to start would be looking at where you spend your money, your time, and your energy. Because, truth be told, what matters most to you is likely where you spend a majority of your time, your money, and your energy. So, what matters most to you? This might be a good thing. Don't get me wrong. It could be something good. But it is not the best. It is not the best thing. And, you know, it's actually a cliche nowadays to the point where people get to the end of their lives, the December of their years, as the song says. They look back on the years they've spent on this earth and they reflect on how they spent their time, their money, their energy. And many times folks are full of regret because they know they didn't spend it on what really matters, what matters most. We hear stories about this all the time, this wisdom that is being passed down from people who come before us and yet we still ignore it. And then we get to their stage of life, we end up telling the exact same story. Oh, if I could go back and do it different. Instead of chasing all these things, I would invest my time, my money, and my energy into things that really matter. So what do we do? How do we actually build our lives centered on what matters most. Uh, Not to just us, but in our lives and those in our family and our friends. What really matters most in the end? Well, if you've been with us during the entire seven weeks of this series, during the entire series, you know 
where the answer is going to come from. We're learning the Jesus way of life, so in order to learn the Jesus way of life, let's see what Jesus has to say about it. Because nobody lived a life more full of purpose, more intentional, more meaningful, more impactful than Jesus did. And here we are literally still talking about him over 2,000 years later because of the legacy he left, the wisdom that he taught, the example that he has set that has shaped generation after generation. And so if we're going to learn to live the Jesus way of life, live a life that really matters, if you want to learn what it is that should matter most to us, there's nowhere better to look than Jesus Christ himself. So what we're going to do is going to look at that time where Jesus was asked the question, what really matters most? What's most important? And we're going to look at what he had to say, and then we're going to try to figure out how we can apply that to our own lives. So in our gospel lesson this morning, the religious leaders of Jesus' day by this time are pretty desperate. They're publicly confronting Jesus, and they're trying to trick him up, discredit him, hoping that they can get him in a gotcha question. Now, there are questions about the greatest commandment. This actually comes after questions that they've had for him about whether or not to pay taxes to Caesar. Questions about the resurrection. And just like in those discussions, Jesus confounds those scribes and Pharisees, not only with his superior biblical knowledge, but with his irrefutable logic. When he's asked what the greatest commandment is, which commandment is the greatest, they're hoping to trick him up again. But Jesus quotes Judaism's most fundamental, ancient, most widely read biblical passage. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. But then Jesus doesn't just leave it there. He adds another scripture. This one not as well known. Little known scripture from the exciting book of Leviticus. <laughs> if, if you're having... If you've got insomnia, I highly suggest opening up your Bible and start reading Leviticus. But there are some nuggets in Leviticus that are excellent, and Jesus quotes one of those nuggets from Leviticus 19.18. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And the interesting thing is here, it almost sounds like Jesus is giving us two commandments, because he even says, and the second is like it. But not really. Jesus is telling us that these two commandments are two sides of the same exact coin. For you see, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws hang on that, on that one, he says. It's impossible Jesus is saying to love God and not love your neighbor. You can't do it. And the beauty of it is, in loving our neighbor, we're loving God. Jesus knew this. That's that irrefutable logic. That, that biblical knowledge that Jesus not only knew, but he lived out and gave us the example. This answer, though, provided a problem for those Pharisees. It provides a problem for us as well, because for many of the Pharisees, the thinking is, well, wait a minute. If the God of Israel loves all nations and all people as much as God loves us, well, everything about our identity now is threatened. If all people are God's chosen people, are, the, are we then to love the unclean and the rejected? I mean, we, we are God's chosen people. But Jesus is saying, 
We're all God's chosen people. Well, now I've got to love the beggar, the unclean, the leper, the rejected, the non-Jew, as much as Jesus loves them. By what, by saying what Jesus is saying in this passage, he's calling into question the very foundation of their religious identity and practice. While the scribes and Pharisees liked to use the law to restrict the definition of neighbor and therefore give an excuse not to show love to neighbor for whatever reason, Jesus put these two passages of Scripture today into what we call the greatest commandment, and he smashes all the limits, the boundaries of who our neighbor is. In chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel, if we go over there, we'll see that Jesus has already, already radically reshaped the definition of neighbor. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then the very next verse, he says, God makes his sun shine on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So what is Jesus saying there? A person who truly loves God, brace yourself person who truly loves God will also love his or her enemies. Now it's, we can say amen when Jesus says, oh, love God with all you got and love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus is saying, even if your neighbor is your enemy, that's tough because to love God is to love in the same way that God loves, without conditions. To love God is to love who God loves, which is everyone. The loving all people, even my enemies, unconditionally, that's not natural for us. That's why it's tough. It's difficult. Let me tell you something. This this loving the Jesus way, Loving God's way, following this greatest commandment, it ain't for wimps. It ain't for wimps. There's no doubt about that. Our journey as Christians in this life is to seek to learn the way God loves us and then show that love to others. And there's nothing harder. There is nothing more difficult than this. But there is nothing more exciting, nothing more freeing, Nothing more life-giving. There was a person who once wrote, As long as I allow hate, pain, fear, or pride keep others at a distance, they remain strangers, different, and therefore a threat. Only by befriending neighbors, strangers, and enemies do we begin to understand them and love them. So think about it. How can God love every person? How can we love every person, even our enemies? Well, God loves every person because God knows every person, whether they recognize him or not. It can be easy to judge and to hate if we don't make an effort to know and to understand. I had a wise Gentlemen, in this congregation this morning tell me just a couple of days ago, hurt people hurt people. And that's very, very true. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. A few years ago, I was serving as lay leader at a church. And there was a guy that was hired on staff that... I was part of the interview process and everything. I'm, I'm just going to be frank and honest with you. I didn't like this guy. I didn't like him. I didn't like his attitudes. I didn't like his personality. I didn't like anything about him. I didn't want to hire him. 
But I lost that vote. And he was hired anyway. Sunday mornings, we exchanged pleasantries. But I wasn't going to go out of my way to spend any extra time, any more time than I needed to with him. Because I didn't like him. I did not like him. And to be honest, I don't think he really cared for me either. Well, he'd been there for some time, and I tolerated it. And there was one day I was getting ready. I was, I was planning on going, going and having some lunch. And as I'm getting ready to go to lunch, I'm planning on having lunch by myself. As I'm getting ready to go, he, for some reason, came to mind. And it was like a a nudge from the Holy Spirit to call him, invite him to lunch. And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I am not going to spend my precious lunchtime with this guy. I'd rather do anything else. But I wrestled with it and wrestled with it, and I finally did. I called him, and I said, hey. I'm having lunch at such and such place. Uh, I was just calling to see if you might want to come join me for lunch. He agreed. We met for lunch. We ordered our lunch. We're eating. Again, exchanging niceties. Superficial. We got to talking about some things at the church and all of that. And I finally said to him, you know, I didn't originally want to call you to come eat lunch with me today. And he kind of looked at me and I said, I've got to confess to you that I I have not really liked you since the day I met you. And I said, uh, I've been, what it was boiling down to was a jealousy. He was more talented than I was. There's no doubt about it. And it was jealousy on my part. But I did not really know him. I did not take time to get to know him. I didn't want to take time to get to know him. But when I did, he looked across the table and he said, I, he accepted my apology and he said, I want you to know that because I'm on staff, and you're a member of the laity, I was reluctant to say this, but I haven't really ever liked you either. We shook hands. We buried the hatchet. We got to know one another. All of a sudden, he's no longer my enemy because I took the leading of the Holy Spirit to call him and just have lunch to get to know him a little bit, and found out he's not really as big a jerk as I thought he was. And I tease him now. Uh, we call each other jerks now, but it's in more picking on one another. But you see what I'm saying? A perceived enemy was somebody that was an enemy in my mind because I didn't take the time to actually get to know them. Many of our judgments of others are not based on knowledge or getting to know someone. Many of our judgments are based on, let's call it what it is, it's ignorance. Because we don't know them. We don't know what they're going through. The more we know someone, the more difficult it is for us to judge them and consider them an enemy. And this doesn't mean that we know exactly what causes some people to do what they do or have the personality that they have. But knowing people means knowing that we all have burdens. We all have stuff that we deal with, right? And knowing God means that we know that God loves us and others despite ourselves. First John says this, Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love 
does not know God, for God is love. Couldn't be any clearer than that, could it? Couldn't be any more difficult than that, could it? There's a scholar who wrote, God's law, finally and forever, is the law of love. It's that simple, but it's that difficult. Because loving others means putting them first. It means sacrificing. It means being vulnerable to the needs of those around us. And all of this can be scary, which is why Jesus does not come just teaching and preaching God's law, but he embodies it. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And in the greatest commandment, that's what he does. Love God with all you got and love other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just a few days after this encounter, Jesus is going to gather his disciples together, take some bread and wine, invite them by eating and drinking to share his very life. After that meal, he'll go out from that place of safety. He'll embrace his destiny, going to the cross to show us just how much God loves us. Because ultimately, the only way we can love each other is first to recognize just how much God loves each one of us. No matter who we are. Do you know how much God loves you? I think it takes a lifetime of experience, of, of journeying with Jesus to even get to the tip of the iceberg. Do you know how much God loves everyone in this room? Do you know how much God loves everyone who is not in this room? Do you know how much God loves that cranky neighbor you got? Do you know how much God loves that coworker that grates on your nerves just as much as he does you? When asked what it's all about, what all the law, the prophet's words hang on, Jesus said, love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself, even your enemies. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean that Jesus was being naive. I mean, he knew real enemies. He knew what evil was. He knew it was real, what it could do. I mean, Rome would often line the roads of Palestine with crosses, and Jesus must have walked among those crosses many times on his way to Jerusalem. The anger and hatred of our world would not have surprised Jesus at all. He knew these things quite well. Yet Jesus commanded his disciples to carry crosses instead of swords. He not only taught it, he lived it. In those hours before his death, he now get this, he was spit on, he was slapped, he was whipped, he was mocked, He was in intense physical pain, and yet, and yet, while hanging from the cross, Jesus prayed for forgiveness for those people who just did that to him. And when he rose from the dead, he didn't come seeking revenge for those who had crucified him. No, he commanded us to spread the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love throughout the world. So if Jesus endured all that, offered forgiveness and did not seek revenge, showing love of neighbor as yourself, even your enemies, I think I can forgive someone whose personality I don't like. I think I might be able to Love the person who said something that might have offended me. I think I might be able to do that. When people see me or you, do they see faulty people who are seeking love, who are forgiving and helping to make the world a better, more peaceful, more fair place for all? If so, Jesus might say, keep going. You're not far from the kingdom. What really matters most? Our original question. According to Jesus, 
the thing that really matters most is loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself. It's important to recognize that to Jesus, these are not just empty words. This is not just some sort of self-help catchphrase. He's not saying that this is the right answer because he's being tested by the Pharisees. No, he is saying the real answer, the true answer, an answer that was reflected in everything he said and did throughout his life because Jesus' life was aligned with his priorities. Everything he was about was about loving God and loving others. Everything he did. That kind of life is the one where when you get to the end of it, you start looking back. Instead of regret, you have gratitude. Because you actually lived a life centered on the things that really matter. The things that matter most. Loving God and loving neighbor. So, I challenge you to make that your mission. As a matter of fact, on your handout, the fill in the blank at the top, our main point this morning, not only of this sermon, but this entire series, is to become the kind of person who loves God with all you are and loves others the same way that Jesus loves you. That kind of life is really, really good. But it's also true. The cost of following Jesus, the cost of becoming that kind of person, is really, really high. And it is difficult. But it is, oh, so worth it. So let us, individually and as a church, keep going. We're not far from the kingdom. Living the Jesus way of life. Loving God with all you got and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, give us the faith to go where you go. Do what you do. Trust what you say, and love how you love. Today, we commit to following you. We are all in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, receive this benediction. Let us go out from this place and inspire love, embrace Christ, engage the world, and tell somebody about Manatee Life Church. Go in peace. Amen. Okay, that wraps up Learning the Jesus Way of Life, the series. And as a matter of fact, that's going to wrap up for the summer. We are going to take a summer break over the next couple of months. We'll be back in September. So no Soul Ramblings podcast during July and August. We'll see you back here the first week of September. Hope you have a great summer. And you can always stay in contact with us here at Soul Ramblings podcast by getting social on Facebook and Instagram. Got links to those pages in the show notes of this episode Go over there, like, subscribe. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast today. And that way you don't miss that new episode when it comes out uh, that first week of September. I want to thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today. I really, really do appreciate it. I know there are a lot of podcasts you can be listening to and look forward to seeing you again in September. Here is a last piece of advice. If you believe in goodness and if you value the approval of God, Fix your minds on whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. Again, have a great summer, everybody. I'm Jerry Wicker. Grace and peace. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already... Subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production.